I sometimes wonder, would it have been better not to go? A Murder at the End of the World is a classic whodunit with a bit of a modern twist. We've all become a little like Darby Hart in a way. We've retreated from each other and we're just like at the computer. I really think we wrote this as a kind of filmic odyssey, love letter to the idea of, of resisting that pull. I remember getting the scripts and thinking it was one of the most original murder mystery plots I'd read in a long time. I hadn't really seen a young woman of sort of my generation at the center of a murder mystery who was so relatable, so human. A very strong young woman called Darby Hart, who I play, he's a sort of Gen Z amateur sleuth. She's invited to this retreat as one of the guests in Iceland. And if the old whodunit used to take place in an English manner, you know, with the upstairs and the downstairs, Gosford Park style, because that was the seat of power in that time, certainly the new seat of power is the tech billionaire's reclusive retreat. A group of the world's smartest, most exceptional minds coming together. Welcome. It's so exciting to see you all here. And then things start to go very awry. There's a death on the first night that they're there, and it's sort of up to Darby to catch the killer before they strike again. The area of contact is small, indicating a hammer or something. Darby's 24 years old, but She's been solving cases since she was 13 on the internet. So she actually has 10,000 hours of experience. It's just a being behind a screen. So what happens when they're taken to a tech retreat? They don't have their cell phones. This is like half my brain. You'll get it back. It's so you can enjoy a device-free experience. And they have to use their sort of body, mind, and spirit to solve this case. Everyone sitting here at this table is an original thinker. That's why you're here. You know, I play a character called Andy Ronson, and he's a super, super wealthy guy at the forefront of artificial intelligence. And he pulls this group of people together to explore some wild ideas he has. We've got an incredible cast, uh, Britt Marling, who wrote, directed, and is in it. It's also a love story. Who doesn't love that? So the dead talk to you? Um, yeah. What have you heard? I play uh, a guy called Bill Farrer, who's a street artist and amateur sleuth, so he meets Darby. We kind of bond over this mutual desire to solving or looking for a murderer or, or, or looking for the missing piece of this unsolved puzzle. There are 40,000 unidentified dead in this country at any given moment. That's a lot of people. Around half of those are thought to be accidental deaths, uh, car crashes, heart attacks but the other half are unsolved murders. So it's like 20,000 unsolved murders. And of course, it's too many cases, too many missing people, too many Jane Doe's, John Doe's for any precinct to handle. Two punk kids who grew up with the internet so they can breathe and think the way the internet thinks. And they're both misfits and outsiders, but they find each other in this like shared passion for solving these things. You're unhackable, Darby. Man would die trying. We bond on that level and then it, it turns into a, a relationship. Cut to five years later and we end up on the same retreat, which feels serendipitous and strange in a few different ways, you know? We really worked hard on juxtaposing the past and the present so that they're always informing each other. And so the idea of telling a story that thought about time not as a linear thing, but time as a circular function. How did you get your phone past Andy? Working with Brit and Zhao was really special for me as a fan of two writers and creators that I've admired from before. They're bold. They've got a unique attack on things. I think they've just weaved a really beautiful tale of a cautionary tale, a murder mystery, and a really beautiful human story. To finding a way out.